Good morning. My name is Karen Pinkall. I'm the director here at First National Bank and I manage the trade services department. And I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Matt Burke. He is a senior advisor of global banking. Matt helps customers reduce the risks associated with conducting business internationally. He works with clients individually to help develop an internal international sales strategy that's able to mitigate the risks associated with global commerce through a full range of international banking solutions. Matt began his career at FMBO as a global banking trader on the Ford Exchange desk. He has additional experience in credit administration, underwriting credit facilities for specialty banking and commercial banking teams, as well as in-depth knowledge on international payment terms. Matt earned his bachelor's degree in business administration, finance, and banking from the University of Nebraska at Omaha and an MBA from Creighton. He's a member of the Midwest International Trade Association, is on the investor board for the World Trade Center, Kansas City, and is a designated lender for the Exim Bank of the United States. He's also was a member of the leadership class, Leadership Nebraska Class 11. So we're happy to have him here today, Matt. I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Karen. Let me pull this up here. Fantastic. Well, again, thank you so much for, uh, for everyone joining today. Um, we're gonna take uh, the next little bit to talk about letters of credit. Um, and so uh, the bank uh, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't let me go forward here if I, if I didn't provide a, a legal disclaimer. Um, and again, this is information we're sharing uh, that, that we believe uh, to be reliable and is best practices that, that we see for our customers. So again, this doesn't necessarily uh, fit everyone's uh, business uh, philosophy or strategy. But again, uh, this is something that, that we talk with our customers about to, to kind of uh, find the right fit of, of international trade products uh, in, in the marketplace. So we'll start with international sales. I, I like to call this a, a balancing act. Um, and really what happens is, is that we have two factors pulling sometimes in opposite directions. Uh, and, and, and my customers are, are, are no different and, and you probably are the same way. We have a sales team that is interested uh, in uh, growing the business, right? And they're going to try to make a sale to anyone who they believe has interest and, and the ability to make a payment. Where we have the credit or the financial side of the business who are looking to only sell to folks who are, are financially solvent enough to, to purchase the, the, uh, the products. Uh, and, and so we see that with the, the account terms and the, the payment terms that, that folks uh, get into. Uh, the first is open account. An open account is, is obviously the greatest for an international sales team. A, a customer has the ability to buy the product and pay for it at a later date. And then you have your, your cash people, your credit people who are saying cash in advance is the best. That's the only way we're going to do international sales. And so, um, and again, so it, what we see is that we do uh, have a, a variety of products that can make both the sales team happy uh, to sell products uh, at, at a higher clip, but also make the credit teams happy uh, and, and the finance team happy. And so what we're going to talk about is, is really two products today. Um, and we'll focus a lot on the letters of credit, but I want to talk about the two main products that we see in the marketplace that, that have the ability to kind of balance out uh, the, the credit team and the sales team. Uh, and so we talked about the, the, the cash in advance and, and open account, but the two that we're going to focus on most today are, are documentary collections and letters of credit. And the reason I want to start with the documentary collection is, is, is really because they're what we call kind of letter of credit light. Um, and so we'll, we'll kind of get into that here in a second. Um, a documentary collection is, is a form of trade where the exporter pays for the goods uh, or the exporter is paid for goods by an importer uh, after the banks are, are exchanging documents. So it kind of provides uh, a, a third rail of, of document uh, uh, flow so that the, the, uh, the documents flow through both international banks uh, of the importer uh, and the exporter. Uh, the exporter bank is going to collect funds uh, from the importer's bank. So that's kind of nice. 
you know that the funds are, 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 are going to be sent between two reliable banks. But in exchange for that, the documents um, are, are released, uh, the documents that are released for the title of goods and customs clearance uh, are really only done after they get to, uh, kind of to the specified location. And so really what this does is it, it kind of has a, has a win-win for both uh, the buyer and, and the seller. The goods are shipped uh, by the exporter. Uh, and the seller is going to present their documents to their international bank. Uh, and so, again, the banks in this situation are under no obligation to honor uh, a draw or uh, a request to send funds. Uh, the most secure form of documentary collections is a site collection. And the buyer doesn't really have to pay until the goods are received at the final port. So when you do see a site collection, uh, the, the buyer of the goods understands that the documents uh, are ready for them to pick up um, and they don't really need to pay until the goods show up at port. Uh, and that's kind of one of the misconceptions, I think, about documentary collections is, is the exporter thinks that they're going to get paid once the goods get on the ship uh, and a bill of lading is produced. But in, in reality, in real, real life, most of the time, uh, the documentary collection is not paid uh, until uh, goods arrive at the uh, importer's port of uh, uh, final port. Uh, we do see a lot of different terms for documentary collections. So uh, we refer to them as documentary collections because that's just the easiest way and it doesn't really confuse folks. But you also see folks who, who utilize the term uh, site draft, time draft, uh, doc, uh, DP, which means uh, documents against payment, DA documents against acceptance or cash against documents. And really one of the things that, that we need to, you need to understand here is that the bank holds these goods, or excuse me, holds these documents uh, for the buyer. Uh, and, and when the buyer is ready to pay, uh, they basically pay for the documents in whatever the invoice uh, is. So in, in this example, if I'm buying uh, $100,000 worth of widgets, to get the documents to clear uh, customs and, and uh, remove goods uh, from, uh, from the port, I'm going to have to pay $100,000 to my international bank. Uh, they will then wire the funds uh, to the exporter. Again, this is important to note that the banks are, are really only there to facilitate the transaction. Uh, they have no obligation for payment. Um, they're going to hold the documents for you until you're uh, until the importer is ready to pay. Uh, the advantage uh, for the seller, uh, again, you do keep some control on this, right? So you are able to say when the goods are, are sent out, uh, where they're received, uh, and you understand that the documents, if again, if it's on uh, documents uh, against payment. The only way that your goods are going to leave the foreign port is if they pay you. Uh, but they do have some disadvantages. You, you do not have a promise to pay. Uh, there's no guarantee from the, the bank. Uh, and, and goods are in a foreign port if someone cancels the order. Uh, so uh, as a seller, as an exporter, uh, you do have some downside risk here. But the good news is, is that the downside risk is a little bit more palatable, um, I think, than uh, uh, you know having an open account terms. So this is kind of that that way to move from uh, a letter of credit to open account terms is move from LC to documentary collections to open account. Um, but uh, but again, that's kind of up up to uh, to all the parties involved. The advantages for the buyer is, is payments really deferred in, until the goods arrive at port. And we, we talked about that here just a second ago. And so uh, the documents that we traditionally see uh, on a documentary collection are the same that we're going to talk about uh, under a letter of credit. We have a bill of lading or an airway bill, commercial invoice packing list, certificate of origin. Sometimes we'll see insurance policies, uh, a little bit less on documentary collections than what we see on letters of credit. Uh, but, you know, if, if you're shipping wood products, the fumigation certificates or uh, other industry documents through, um, you know, the USDA or any other uh, government controlling uh, regulator. Uh, and then 
rules that govern collections, these are specific uh, to only collections, but this is the URC 522, the Uniform Rules of Collections. And we, we did kind of put something on here that says, you know, really the controlling document. So what controls the title uh, of goods are, are traditionally the ones that are starred here, the, uh, the bill of lading and the commercial invoice. So when should you use documentary collections? Uh, when you're stepping down from cash uh, in advance or a letter of credit, you've done business uh, for some time. We see this uh, a lot with dealers and distributors internationally. Uh, it's a way to, to build a relationship, to understand how people pay, uh, and, and it, it kind of gives grace to both the, the exporter and the importer. Uh, and again, when, when we do go to favorable countries and banks, so really strong banks, really strong uh, countries, we see you know, the, the Europe's of the world uh, the Canada's of the world, you, you'll see this instead of like a, a letter of credit. Uh, when we say not to use documentary collections uh, is, is for your first time buyer. Um, you know, again, you have no trust built up with this. Uh, so we don't necessarily suggest this in all instances. Uh, but uh, again, everyone's situation is, is always a little bit unique. Um, if you are going into volatile countries, countries where uh, there is the threat of, of of cancellation from the government. Again, we just we just don't suggest this in those situations. Um, if you go to just a, a, a tiny tiny bank in a very small country, uh, again, not a not necessarily the best of of options. And then for very large dollar amounts, again, you could have a lot of goods sitting at a foreign port uh, and no promise to pay for those. So the remainder of, of our session today, uh, we're gonna really talk about letters of credit. Um, I, I wanna dispel some myths um, at the end and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but you know, it's really important that we, we understand exactly what a letter of credit is. And um, I try not to read too much off my slides, but it's important that, that we understand that a letter of credit is an undertaking issued by a bank for the account of a buyer the applicant to pay the beneficiary provided that the terms and conditions of the LC are complied with. So again, the, the main things here are, it's an undertaking issued by the bank, by uh, the importer's bank for the account of, of a buyer to pay the beneficiary, which is, which is the exporter. Um, and again, the, the main caveat here is that, that the terms and conditions of the LC are met. Uh, those are probably the three areas that we're going to focus in on uh, with uh, a, a large focus that, that we tell our customers and, and our prospects and anyone that we're providing advice to is that the, the terms and conditions can be met. We really have two types of letters of credit that we deal with in, in, in uh, our global banking group, uh, both the standby letter of credit and a commercial letter of credit. So standby, uh, that's really used when there's uh, a chance of default. Uh, we see this a lot with um, utilities. We see it with insurance captives, uh, you know, workers' comp insurance. Uh, we also see it in, in, in performance uh, businesses, uh, commercial uh, construction. Uh, it, it can replace a bond or a surety bond. Uh, it does have the ability to back lease payments. So if, if someone is leasing a space in a strip mall, uh, a, a standby letter of credit can be issued to the owner of the mall on behalf of, of the tenant. Um, it does guarantee loan repayments, uh, and then it can act a, as, as a form of payment. We traditionally don't see a standby used as a form of payment, and now it, it, it can be, it just makes, the, the transaction a little bit more difficult. When, when the standby is used as, as a form of payment, we try to move folks to those commercial letters of credit uh, that we'll talk about. But it is important to note that a standby can be used, but that's really not its intended purpose. It's meant to stand by in case that there is a default uh, uh, along the way. Commercial letters of credit. Uh, this is, you know, uh, uh, it's used when there's a form of payment for a sales transaction being, being taken place. Uh, there is going to be an exchange of goods or services and traditionally uh, involves the shipment of goods. 
um, uh, and documents are required to prove the shipment. And so uh, that's, that's a big deal here is that there's usually a shipment of goods, whether that be on an airplane or uh, a cargo uh, container ship. So when do we see letters of credit being issued? Um, there, again, we see this for a variety of transactions, uh, both when goods are shipped or services are provided, um, but when the seller does feel insecure. So the exporter decides that they believe that they have a little bit of credit risk with the buyer of, the, of their product or, or service, they may want to move to this sort of, of payment. Um, the buyer may also want to utilize an LC. At the beginning of the pandemic, um, we saw a, a tightening in global credit markets. And so the folks who were importing goods from all over the world, we saw uh, an increase in the utilization of, of our issuance of, of import letters of credit. And the reason behind that was the, um, the, the buyer was, um, the, the seller of the goods was, was wanting to finance against um, a letter of credit. And what that allowed is them to go to their uh, bank in China and finance uh, to purchase the raw materials to, uh, to uh, manufacture goods. Uh, the control of movement of funds, we've seen this in, in countries like uh, Egypt, uh, where US dollars um, are, are difficult to uh, come by sometimes. And so when a, a letter of credit uh, or a documentary collection are, are utilized, uh, it allows the, the country to reserve the US dollar amount that needs to be uh, sent for uh, payment on that letter of credit. And then some countries, some industries, uh, we see this sometimes in the beef market uh, as you know, one of the top 10 banks in um, agricultural lending in the United States, FMBO sees us with, with a lot of our protein, uh, where the utilization of a, a letter of credit is, is the standard way of doing business with the country that they're going into, um, or just how the export of that protein is, is utilized. So a letter of credit um, is, is a contract uh, between the issuing bank and the beneficiary. Um, and the bank has to pay or honor the letter of credit as long as all the conditions are met. We'll talk about those conditions here in, in future slides. But the, the main uh, issue here is that the seller, the exporter of the goods is not looking to the end buyer of the goods. They are now looking for the international bank who issues a letter of credit uh, they are looking for them for repayment. So what does this do? This per allows, um, we'll just use China as the example. This allows a small company in China to purchase goods from a U.S. exporter. Uh, and then we can utilize the financial strength of the large financial institution, international bank in China, as, as the, the credit that, uh, that they're utilizing to uh, to underwrite the, the, the sales terms. So uh, exporter in the United States looks to the Chinese bank. Um, and so it's way easier to get financial information from an international bank sometimes than it is from a small company that's trying to import your goods. Uh, to make the contract binding, uh, the terms and conditions are met. We'll talk about that. Uh, and, and it's important to note that if the terms are not complied with, the issuing bank is no longer liable to pay on the contract or the letter of credit. Uh, and, and what this does is this basically turns the letter of credit into a very expect, uh, expensive documentary collection. Um, and, and so we don't like to see that for our customers. Um, and it's something that that our team works extremely hard to, uh, to make sure that, that our customers are able to comply. Uh, and, and that's something that we're extremely proud about. So we'll talk a little bit about the contracts involved and, and you can't, normally I'm, I'm pointing to a screen here when we do this in person, but um, we'll, we'll start at the top. Um, the buyer and seller enter into a contract. This is the, the pro forma invoice. This is the commercial invoice that the buyer and seller agree upon. They're gonna buy uh, you know, 100 widgets and here's the terms of that sale. Here's the dollar amount. 
uh, they sign it, they date it, and we're going to enter into this purchase agreement. At that point, the buyer uh, is going to go to their international bank, and they're going to fill out a letter of credit application. This application is is traditionally um, you uh, it, it's it's done with the pro forma invoice in hand so the bank can help out and then the issuing bank takes that letter of credit application when it's all agreed upon they're going to send the letter of credit to the seller and what we don't have in here is in order for the issuing bank to get it all the way to the seller uh there's going to be uh, a couple of other banks possibly uh involved and they have to be international banks uh but that's where uh our, a company or a bank like FMBO helps is, is we facilitate that transaction uh, and then we provide the letter of credit uh, to the seller. And so really it, the seller and the issuing bank are, are in contract with one another uh, with this letter of credit and the advising bank like FMBO is, is here to help make sure that to say uh, that the letter of credit is valid. It's coming from a valid institution. It was sent through an encrypted method through SWIFT, through what we call an MT700, uh, and that uh, you know, as long as the seller is able to uh, to comply, they're going to get paid on that letter of credit. So, what does an LC do for the seller, right? So, this is the exporter in this example uh, that we're utilizing here in in the United States. Uh, the independent credit backing. We talked about this with the a clear cut promise to pay from an international bank. Uh, again, a, a credit team, if, if you do have a full team that works solely on understanding the credit risks of your buyers, they're able to find the financials or a Moody's rating or an S&P rating very easily on an international bank. Sometimes that's very difficult for a, a small business, but uh, I would always say that no matter who you're selling to, whether it's internationally or domestically, you're asking for those financial statements to understand, does your buyer uh, have uh, the, the financial wherewithal to, to purchase your goods. Um, again, we talk about it substitutes the bank's credit for the applicant's credit and the payment is assured. Uh, what we like to see here is that uh, if you are the, the seller of the goods, it does protect you against order cancellation. If you make that those 100 widgets, comply with everything, the dates, send it all the way over uh, to, to China or wherever the country you're exporting to, and the Chinese customer decides they don't want those goods for whatever reason, they found a different supplier, a different buyer, cheaper, it doesn't matter. As long as you can provide the documents to your bank and the, um, uh, and the, the foreign bank, you're going to get paid. They have to pay you uh, no matter if, if there is a cancellation from the order. So why would a buyer want to do this? Um, we've seen this on, on a variety of import deals. Uh, we had, we, we'll talk about that here in a second, but it assures that shipment was made on time and that the terms of the LC are met. Uh, the documents that are requested, again, the title for the documents, those are traditionally uh, included in a letter of credit so that customs clearance uh, and title are transferred with these documents and you can get the goods from port very easily. And then the payment isn't made until documents um, are, or till the goods are shipped, right? Because we either have to have an airway bill or uh, an ocean bill of lading uh, and, and uh, prepared and then documents are, are, are presented. Um, or in case, the, in, in case someone is not able to comply, uh, the buyer does uh, prove the discrepancy. Um, and that, again, makes it to, uh, to a, uh, a documentary collection. Um, we're going to talk real quick about a confirmed letter of credit. And we like to talk about these, this payment term um, uh, diagram here, all the way from cash in advance to open account. And, and what's the, the risk to the seller, right? Um, so from minimum on the far left, cash in advance, to, to the most risk, which is open account. Um, a confirmed letter of credit does add some security to already to a commercial letter of credit. If there is uh, any uh, any second guessing of the creditworthiness of that international bank, you can ask for uh, your uh, commercial letter of credit to be confirmed, and it adds security of another bank involved. And so, 
the exporter is now looking at the confirming bank to pay. Uh, and so the confirming bank is then taking a look at the issuing bank of the letter of credit to understand, are, are they financially sound enough to, uh, to back the letter of credit? Um, they're not necessarily for all uh, LCs. Again, we would, we would suggest folks take a look at the risk in the dollar amount of the transaction in the countries that it's going to, uh, but we can confirm both uh, commercial and standbys. A letter of credit has, has three options when confirming. Uh, there's confirm, which means it has to be confirmed. There's the may confirm, which gives the um, which gives the exporter the benefit of of deciding until later if if the letter of credit needs to be confirmed or without. Um, we don't suggest uh, you doing uh, a confirmation with the bank branch. So you have Bank of Tokyo. Uh, we would not suggest Bank of Tokyo, New York as, as, a, as a, uh, a viable option when confirming. Um, bank uh, branch banks just don't add anything to it. If the, the, the parent organization were to fail, most likely the branch would also fail. Um, and so, Banks can confirm the LC, but not confirm amendments. And that's important to know if, if you do have a transaction that does require one. And, um, and, and so our, our recommendation on, on most letters of credit is to always give the exporter the opportunity to, to confirm it if you're the exporter. So we always suggest saying a, a may confirm is, is usually the best uh, option. And we'll get into um, the, the MT700, but this is just an example of what the letter of credit would look like uh, if you do have a confirmation instructions. Uh, and so in, in this in instance, the letter of credit is without a confirmation. So uh, the letter of credit would not be confirmed. So now we're gonna scoot up a little bit on, on the risk here uh, from the confirmed letter of credit to the unconfirmed letters of credit. Um, and again, we talked about this in exchange for goods or service or a payment, and the shipment of goods is usually uh, required to prove that the, the, the goods are being moved. Um, there are necessary elements to, to every LC. Um, the main thing here that we talk about is, again, it has to have a number that can be easily identified. We need to know who the applicant is, who the beneficiary is, their name and address, what type of payment terms? We'll talk about that, whether it's, you know, uh, 30, 60, 90 days bill of lading date, uh, whether it's a site. We'll also talk a little bit about the INCO term while we're talking about payments, uh, payment terms. And the INCO term is, is a really important uh, uh, element when doing business internationally, because that's really telling everyone what their job is during uh, the buying and selling of goods internationally who's paying for shipment, who's paying for, uh, uh, you know, where the goods are to be picked up, where they'd be dropped off, who's paying for insurance, those sorts of things. So an INCO term, very, very important. Uh, the description of goods, uh, you know, the documents that are required, there's sometimes additional conditions. Uh, the other time is, is the latest ship date uh, and when, and the expire of the LC, but again, we always suggest that all commercial letters of credit are issued by the UCP 600. Uh, and, and these are really kind of the necessary uh, elements to, to the letter of credit. Now, in a letter of credit, there, uh, there can be up to six banks, um, five or six banks involved. Uh, the, the most simple ones have an issuing bank and an advising bank. Uh, and then the advising bank can be the negotiating and confirming bank. And sometimes a re reimbursing bank is, is uh, added. And what that does is the reimbursing bank acts on the behalf of the issuing bank and pays on the letter of credit uh, and, and makes that payment move a little bit faster. Uh, that's what we kind of see sometimes with, with branch banks or uh, you know, related banks uh, here in the United States. So the issuing bank, uh, this, is, this is the importer's bank uh, they're going to issue the letter of credit in accordance with the UCP 600 and uh, banking practices, and they're going to select the advising and confirming bank. Um, hopefully, they respond promptly to requests, uh, 
There's some countries where my team will tell me it's going to take a couple of days or a week. Uh, and that's just, that's just kind of dependent on the banking system and, and the, uh, the country that we're dealing with. Um, but again, they issue the letter of credit on behalf of the applicant. Again, the application form on this, um, the buyer is going to submit that with the pro forma invoice um, to the bank, and then the bank will give a draft. Um, we always recommend that a draft be reviewed by every party, both the buyer, seller of the goods, before it's issued. Um, and what this does is it saves time, it saves money, and it saves a lot of headache. Um, and so that's uh, probably the most important here after the LC application is, is filled out is that the draft is reviewed. The advising bank, um, again, this is gonna verify that the letter of credit is authentic. Uh, it came in through the proper channels uh, and, and most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's through SWIFT. And banks utilize uh, the SWIFT network to communicate uh, money transfers. They can use to communicate a, a variety of different things. But uh, in, in a letter of credit in MT700 is, is the message that banks send and receive uh, with a letter of credit. And they're going to advise the beneficiary, right? This is, this is the exporter uh, with its cover letter indicating whether the credit is if they're going to pass it on or if they're going to be there to help them to negotiate uh, and uh, examine the documents of a letter of credit. They'll also uh, work with any amendments with the beneficiary. When the letter of credit is sent uh, to you as the exporter, they're going to provide a cover letter. And the cover letter is, is very important because um, you should be reading this um, from front to back every single time you get it just to make sure nothing has changed. Um, but this is gonna provide you, uh, uh, if something disagrees with the letter of credit, you wanna call the advising bank. And then it, it does uh, offer whether the LC is going to be confirmed or if there's gonna be no engagement. We also suggest uh, that the advising bank um, that the LC is freely negotiable, but we'll, we'll talk about that here in a second. So the nominated or negotiating bank, they're the one that's going to examine the documents um, uh, that they're in compliance with the letter of credit. Uh, and then they're going to follow the beneficiary's instructions um, should documents be discrepant. They forward the, 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 all of the documents that are required. They forward that to the issuing bank. Uh, and they also claim reimbursement. Um, again, this is important to know that the nominated or negotiating bank can be the same as the advising bank, but it could also be different. So each letter of credit is different. We try to, we tell folks the simpler, the better on, on this type of transaction. So make the nominated or negotiating the same as the advising and you kind of take out uh, a degree of difficulty when doing letters of credit. So 41A uh, on the uh, MT700, that's where you're going to see um, the available with uh, any bank and by negotiation. So that's that's our standard. That's what we we think is probably the easiest when dealing with letters of credit. And a confirming bank. Um, we talked a little bit about this, but again, this is kind of the belt and suspenders. Um, they... Uh, they're going to add their credit worthiness to the letter of credit. And then the beneficiary of the letter of credit is now looking to the confirming bank uh, for payment. Um, they must honor and pay as, as long as the conditions um, and terms are all met. It's kind of the main thing that, that we deal with here on, on a confirming bank. So the rest of our time, we're going to go through... Uh, an example here. And again, we're, we're 30 minutes into a presentation. We'll probably take about 20 more minutes and then we'll take a few questions. But the main thing here is that, again, we talked about the common documents to a documentary collection, the common documents to a letter of credit. This is what 99% of our letters of credit will see. There's always going to be uh, a document that the, um, that the buyer of the goods is wants to add. Uh, but the more documents you add, the more complex it makes. And so, again, our, our whole thing is make it, make it very simple. Um, the documents that we see are drafts, 
uh, invoices, transportation document, this is the ocean bill of lading, uh, the airway bill, uh, you're gonna have your packing list, you're gonna have a wait list, insurance policy, certificate of origin by the Chamber of Commerce, any beneficiary certificate, um, and then other documents, USDA, fumigation certs, those sorts of things. Um, again, those are gonna be all required. Um, so, uh, most of them will be required uh, as title of the goods and to clear customs and the port. So the main thing here is this is an example of an MT700. Um, and uh, what you'll see is that uh, this documentary collection or this, uh, this letter of credit in field 20 has a documentary credit number. Uh, so again, we talked about that it has to have the right number. We talk about its issuing date. Um, and then the rules. So you're either going to see the UCP 600 or the UCP latest version. And um, so if the latest version means whatever is the last one that's um, that's there, the place and date of expiry. Uh, so when and where does it expire? Does it expire in the uh, applicant's country? Does it expire, expire in the US? Uh, and then the applicant's banks, this is who's issuing it. And then who's the applicant? And then who's the beneficiary? This is going to be you as an exporter. Um, or the the buyer of the goods. Uh, and then we go to 32B, which is the currency code and amount. What's the LC amount? Um, and then sometimes when you're selling grains, proteins, meats, those sorts of things, there can be a percentage, uh, a plus or minus. So you agree on a term for uh, a, a million pounds of, uh, of grain. Uh, there can be a tolerance in there because it's going to be very difficult to get it exactly on 1 million pounds. There can be a 5% tolerance either way. So it's either 5% higher, 5% lower, uh, and then the price is, is, a, is a agreed upon uh, on the unit basis, not necessarily the, uh, the whole dollar amount. Again, we talked about who's the LC available with, um, and, and then what we'll talk about is, you know, partial shipments, no, trans shipments, this is the 43P, uh, that's kind of there about a quarter of the way down. Uh, and then what ports is this going to be utilized? This is an interesting one because this is actually, um, uh, it's going to require an airway bill if we're going to an airport, not an ocean port. Uh, and then the one thing I will point out on 44C is the latest date of shipment. When is the latest that the airway bill or ocean bill of lading can be dated. Uh, and that's it right there. And then the description of goods. We'll also have uh, the documents required on 45A and then any additional conditions below that. So in this one, um, the documents that, that were required uh, requires a draft uh, because it was a site letter of credit and who's it payable to. Um, again, ABC Corporation is the beneficiary here. An ABC Corporation utilizes a draft to request payment on the letter of credit. So you'll notice that the uh, the the dollar amount is is written out in words uh, and uh, in uh, numbers. That's similar to a check, uh, and then it's also signed and dated. A commercial invoice. Uh, we will say this on a variety of these these documents, but. This is not a commercial invoice that comes out of your ERP system. This is not something that comes out of, uh, you know, QuickBooks. This is a specific document that you create uh, traditionally in Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel that you're able to copy and paste the description of goods into this document because whatever is in the LC needs to match uh, exactly. So you'll see that uh, the description of goods here is the exact wording, spacing, and everything from the letter of credit. And so if you have uh, a sophisticated international bank using their online platform, you're able to copy those, uh, that, uh, that description and just paste it directly into, you, into your, uh, your letter of credit, which it just makes things way easier. Again, it's signed, it's dated, the dollar amount is written uh, in, in dollars, and you have uh, the, um, the documentary uh, uh, or the letter of credit number is also written on here. So this is uh, an airway bill from Bax Global. Uh, you'll notice that, uh, that the um, ABC Corporation up in the top left 
uh, and the uh, applicant, the uh, XYZ company uh, in Vietnam is right there. Uh, again, we don't need to necessarily go into uh, a bunch of detail here, but we just need to know that ABC is sending it to XYZ company. And then we're also going to look at the dollar amount of the transaction and what date that this was sent. A packing list, again, something we always see detailed packing list, but a packing list, um, you know, we're going to say it, it, you need to have the weights, you need to have, um, you know, how many cartons, those sorts of things, the weight in kilograms, the dimensions, those will all be kind of spelled out for you. Uh, but again, you put in the invoice number, you put in the letter of credit number, you put in the date, and you have it signed. Again, and if, if the letter of credit calls for a quality and quantity certificate, you go into Microsoft Word and you create a quality slash quantity certificate issued by the manufacturer. Again, this doesn't need to be um, uh, a, a very uh, pretty document to look at. It just needs to have the requirements that are in the LC. Um, and so, uh, again, on the additional conditions, they have to certify that the material shipped has been inspected and found to be in compliance with respect to the following. Quality, quantity, specs, proper packing for export, proper marking for export, signed, dated, uh, LC numbers on there. Certificate of origin, uh, again, they always say issued by Chamber of Commerce. Uh, so you need to understand that, that you will most likely have to provide this. And again, this is uh, traditionally for, for customs clearance and title to the goods. Uh, we do have an insurance policy uh, on this that was required. So you do have to provide a copy. Now, again, this is why the INCO term is important because if you have to provide this document, we say you should be the one that has to make the document. If you're relying on the importer to provide you the document, you're not going to get it on time. It's not going to be correct, and you have no recourse to change it. So we, we want folks to, to have that recourse and the ability to contact their logistics provider uh, to, to change, whether that's the insurance, bill of lading, airway bill, those sorts of things. We just want everyone to have that control uh, so that they can get paid on time. A beneficiary certificate, uh, again, very similar to the other ones. You'll notice that the top of this document doesn't change. We have the ABC Corporation, their address, uh, the title of the certificate, whatever, whether that's the invoice, uh, packing list, the applicant's name, terms of payment, letter of credit number, and uh, a copy and paste of whatever uh, conditions are put in that letter of credit. And that's at the bottom there. We hereby certify that one set of non-negotiable documents have been sent by the seller to the applicant immediately from the airway bill date. And in this case, they also sent the DHL of the uh, um, sending the package over there. And a fax. So what do we see from common discrepancies uh, on, uh, on our letters of credit? The, the number one is late shipment. If you can't ship the goods by the date on the letter of credit, uh, we'll talk about amendments later. Uh, late presentation, that the documents aren't uh, prepared and presented to uh, the exporter's bank to be sent overseas. Uh, they don't have them in time. They didn't prepare them. The goods are already sent on the boat uh, and the LC is about to expire. Uh, we do see sometimes that documents that are called for in the LC aren't provided. And, and again, this is country specific, but we get a lot of different things where it needs to be inspected in country or uh, inspected by a third party and it's not provided. Again, it's not going to affect the title of the goods, but it will affect the, the um, efficacy of the letter of credit. So from a commercial invoice, what do we see? It's not signed. You're going to see this. This is number one thing on almost every document you're going to see here. Almost everything needs to be signed. And if you have any, uh, any second guesses on whether it should be signed, just sign it. It's going to be okay. Uh, the description of goods is not the same as what it is on the LC. Again, they need to match exactly. Um, sometimes what we'll see is that the the number of originals is not uh, is not uh, complied with. We we'll usually say three originals and one copy. Um, again, too much conflicting information, um, or it's overdrawn or underdrawn. 
Oops. We'll go back to the transport document. Again, not signed correctly. Uh, this is a, a document where we're going to have to comply with the ports that they say. So if they need the goods to go out of, we'll just say, um, Seattle or Vancouver, you have to say it's out of Seattle or Vancouver. If it's out of Houston, it's out of Houston. You cannot change the port uh, once it's in the letter of credit. And if you do change the port, uh, that's an issue. What we see a lot of times is the port is any U.S. port. They don't really care as long as it gets out. So we know that, you know, L.A. Long Beach is, is uh, you know, has some delays right now. But, you know, you can probably get stuff out of New York pretty, uh, pretty easily. Um, again, the uh, consignee is incorrect. The notify party is incorrect. The shipper is incorrect. This is if Again, the shipper should should be um, identified as as the company who's shipping it. The description of goods isn't consistent, uh, and again, the number of of originals and uh, uh, copies is, is not correct. In the packing list, cartons number of cartons and weights don't match the the uh, the bill of lading or airway bill. This is the number one thing we see uh, where you also have conflicting information on invoices or other documents. Insurance policy, it's not made out correctly, not endorsed, not signed. It's dated after the shipment has, has already happened or started, right? So again, the insurance policy does no good if the insurance, the insurance policy is dated uh, today uh, and the shipment started two weeks ago, right? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, and then the description of goods is incorrect. So what are our tips? Hire professionals. Uh, if you do not have a professional on staff, utilize your logistics provider. If your logistics provider does not do documentation on letters of credit, then find a third party to help you. Um, dealing with CFOs, controllers, CEOs, presidents of companies, I will tell you making these documents is not worth the time and money that you make on a per hour basis. Uh, for a couple hundred dollars, you can have all of your documentation handled uh, either by a third party or your logistics provider. Again, I, I, we talked about not using your ERP pro forma invoice or commercial invoice. These are specific invoices and documents that need to be created outside of the traditional system. Um, and if you can do a, have the LC being reimbursed by US Bank, not as big of a deal here to me, as fast as money is moving um, around the world, but it does uh, add a little bit of a uh, little bit of certainty that you're going to get your money pretty fast. Um, and again, use your forwarder, use your logistics provider when doing any of these sorts of uh, of transactions. You want control of the documents. You want control of the goods. Watch your dates for the expiry date and the presentation date. If the bank is closed, you have the next business day. Expiry date on a shipping date is that exact date. There is no weekends, there is no holidays. If it's not correct, um, then it's, uh, it's, the documents are discrepant. And what to do if, if your discrepancies happen? Correct them if time permits. Uh, what we see is a company uh, agrees to an order, they think that they can get it done, but delays in employment, delays in for, you know, getting raw materials happen. Uh, and if you can't comply with the letter of credit, ask for the amendment, the $75 uh, to 150 bucks worth of, of amendment fees that you're gonna pay, well worth it in the end to have the uh, peace of mind that you're gonna get paid uh, when, when providing uh, the documents to, to the international banks. Um, credit may not be amended without, the, without all the parties um, agreeing to it. So that could be, again, those five banks we talked about, the issuing, confirming, negotiating, uh, you know, reimbursing banks. Sometimes all of them have to agree with the amendment. Sometimes that's not the case. Again, that's why we say the fewer banks in the, in the process, the better. Uh, and so, uh, but everyone ha is gonna have to agree to the amendment. That's the beneficiary, that's the applicant, the applicant's bank and the negotiating and advising bank. Again, uh, amendments are costly. They're time consuming. They take days to do. Um, you're talking a couple hundred dollars because everyone's paying an amendment fee, both the applicant and the beneficiary. Um, 
we partial acceptance is not permitted. You have to agree to all of the amendment or none of the amendment. And then we see people trying to do amendments on amendments and it just makes things extremely difficult. So that's why we ask to see the draft of the LC before it's issued. Discounted letters of credit. This is as, as big of a win-win as, as we see out there. Uh, buyers are getting paid when the documents are accepted by the beneficiary bank, or excuse me, the, uh, the issuing bank. Uh, so the buyer uh, is, and, and then the seller, uh, actually, I, I apologize, I have those incorrect. The seller uh, has, uh, uh, gets paid right away. Uh, the buyer has extended payment terms. Again, what governs letters of credit, uh, the UCP 600, um, and then standbys are either UCP 600 or ISP 98. So, uh, you know, I've taken about 50 minutes of your day here talking about one type of, or one or two types of, of international uh, payment terms. And really, uh, letters of credit and documentary collections can probably be a three-day seminar when, when we talk about all of the, uh, the pain points, the issues, the complexities that happen. But um, what's the conclusion I want you to come out of this with? It, it, letters of credit can be daunting to a person who's never done one before. But if you keep the requirements, the documents, and the banks involved very simple, it can be very easy. Uh, and then you also want to find extremely capable partners, right? And so that's your international bank. Uh, again, you can't do this if you do not have a relationship with an international bank. Uh, you need to have a great logistics provider who's moving the goods back and forth. Uh, and you want to have someone who's able to help you with document preparation. Whether that's in-house, you hire someone specifically to do letters of credit. And we have this uh, with a couple of our customers. They have in-house folks doing the documents. We also have a lot of customers who utilize a third party or their logistics provider to do the documents. And having a, a good line of communication from the international bank to the logistics provider and the doc prep folks is really important. And we work with, with both groups of, of, of logistics providers and doc prep people to make sure our customers uh, have, uh, have the best ability to comply with the, uh, with the terms and conditions of the letter of credit. With that being said, um, I will go ahead and uh, and turn it over to Karen. I think we may have a couple of questions, and um, and uh, Karen will help me uh, facilitate that. Yep, you're right, Matt. We had a couple questions come in, so I will um, ask you those. But first, someone had asked for a copy of the presentation. So if you want a copy of the presentation, you can see Matt's email address right there. You can just shoot him a quick email, and he'll be happy to send that over to you. Um, but Matt, yep. one of the questions we had, um, are documentary collections and letters of credit more common in certain countries or regions? Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, as as your again, it's it, it's kind of all custom. Uh, trying to think of the right word here, but it, it's all based on what area of the world you're dealing with. Um, and like I said, uh, we have. Uh, folks who export beef um, to, uh, uh, to Korea. That's done on a letter of credit every single time. And it could be a buyer who was bought from that company for 10 years. Um, but at that point, that's just the standard way of doing business is the letter of credit. Um, and documentary collections, um, you know, we see that a lot um, when going into the Middle East. We see a lot of documentary collections to Saudi Arabia, uh, in those uh, those countries, not as many um, not as many letters of credit there. But again, the banking system in South Korea is is very advanced, very sophisticated, uh, and so doing letters of credit with a sophisticated bank uh, on both sides of the uh, the transaction make it a, a very simple. Uh, doing a, a documentary collection to a bank in Saudi Arabia sometimes has its benefit because we're not necessarily needing the financial stability of the bank there uh, to, uh, to help. So uh, yes, it just depends on, on the, the country you're going to. It also depends on the industry um, or the goods that you're shipping. Okay, sounds good. 
Um, we had a question about the how much it costs to get a letter of credit confirmed. So can you talk about the things that banks look at when um, they get a request for to confirm a letter of credit? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, your international bank is um, when they take the uh, obligation of confirming the letter of credit, they're looking at a variety of, of factors. Um, the number one is the financial institution risk, right? So the bank uh, that issued the letter of credit, what are the odds that they fail? Okay. So that is, that's a, a really tricky question um, because uh, the confirming bank is looking now to that international bank to, to pay them. Uh, and so what does that look like? We're also looking at country risk um, and country risk has its own set of risks involved. Can you get US dollars out of the country? Can you get foreign currency out of the country? Can you get documents out of the country? Uh, so banks are looking at, at, at a lot of different options here um, uh, and, and factors in confirming. So. Confirming a letter of credit uh, coming from Canada is way less expensive than confirming a letter of credit coming from Bangladesh. Uh, and there's reasons for that, but uh, Canada, very sophisticated banking system, very strong banks. Uh, Bangladesh, it may have some strong banks, but the reputation and the country risk do add, um, do add to the cost. So. Um, that's something to, to think about. So when, when you do have a letter of credit being confirmed, um, you're going to have to, to understand that, 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 that cost will vary based off of where the LC is coming from, uh, and the dollar amount of that. So it's usually as a percentage of the, the, uh, the face value of the letter of credit. Sounds good, thank you. We had a couple early questions come in, but you had already on, answered those in your presentation. So that's great since we're running out of time. So I wanna thank Matt for being here today and speaking to all of us about uh, trade services, letters of credit, documentary collections. Again, his email is right there on your screen. You can send him a quick message um, if you want the presentation or if you have any questions about letters of credit or um, foreign exchange or trade, he's happy to help you with those. So thanks again, Matt. and. We will take a five minute break before our next speaker comes on. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Karen.